So what I want to do um, th this morning with you all is to sort of whet your appetite for this evening. Um, this evening we're going to look a lot more in depth. What I want to do is I want to take some stories that you may or may not be familiar with. You probably are familiar with many of these stories if you even grew up remotely around church. Even if you didn't grow up around church at all, you probably will know some of these stories just because they're sort of common stories that even people who don't go to church know. But what I want to do is I want to take some stories and I want to read them in a way that gives you some tools for your toolbox. Um, I, I'm convinced when I, when I look at the data, 11% of the Christians in America read their Bible daily. You heard that right, 11%. Um, that's just not right. There's just, it's just something's wrong there. And I, and I don't mean that in a snarky way or I'm not trying to put any guilt on anybody, but, but, but there's something deficient by us not wanting to spend the time in the Word of God. So what I want to do is hopefully encourage you and excite you about Scripture um, today in such a way that you leave going, wow, that is a really cool book. There's a lot more there than I had any idea. And I hope that what you will do is come back tonight at 6. So, so here, here's, here's the little um, announcement. If you want to go to heaven, it's tonight at 6. You know, it's just, just a joke, a, a total joke. But, but I, I really would love to see you here. I think you will learn a lot. I think you will leave with today and, and this evening. You'll leave with a lot that helps you um, in, your, in your study of Scripture. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take some stories and we're going to work through them. And I'm going to give you some tools that I think will help you um, in, in your Bible reading. So let's get to, let's get to work here. The first story um, is what I call the wounding of Adam. You probably are aware of Adam and Eve. Most people, even if they don't go to church, are at least familiar with those, with those terms. And so when we go back to Genesis in chapter 2, <clears throat> we read a strange story, and I want to read it, and, and, and then I want to sort of give you some commentary on it, and then I want to show you how it reaches from Genesis 2 <clears throat> to John 19, and you can see that there is a thread <clears throat> that runs through Scripture, because Scripture, although written by people is, is inspired. And if we were to go to the library and pull 66 books off of the library shelf and we were to open them up and read them, we would not find themes that run through all of those 66 books. And the reason being is because they were written by different people. Okay, well, the Scripture has 66 books written by many different people, over 40 different people. And there's themes that run through all of those 66 books, which really means there's sort of a divine mind that's organizing what's going on. Paul calls it God-breathed. And, and, and to, when he writes to Timothy, he says, Scripture is God-breathed. So let's, let's look here. Go back to the garden. Let's see if we can see some things, maybe pique our interest a little bit, and then we'll work through some more stories. And I think this will be something that's beneficial to, to everybody. So <clears throat> in Genesis 2, it says, The Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon the man. This is, in Hebrew, the, the deep sleep is like a coma or a death-like sleep. And while he slept, he took one of his ribs. Hebrew is a little unclear whether it's ribs or substance. We're not quite sure. But he took something out of the side of Adam, and then he closed up its place with flesh. Now, what's not being said here, but the, the writer would assume that you would know this as, as you've read through the, through the text, is that Adam here is still sinless. Chapter 3 is where the fall of humanity happens. So Adam, get this, in his sinlessness is wounded in his side. Substance is taken out of his side. It's closed back up. And then we're told, and the rib that the Lord God had taken from the man, he made into a woman and brought her to the man. So the substance that was taken out of his side formed his bride. And when Adam woke from the sleep, he woke to his bride. Why is that important? What's going on there? Well, in Scripture, we're told, Jesus tells us in Luke 24, that we're told as he walks from Jerusalem to Emmaus on resurrection morning, he walks with two disciples, and it's about a six to six and a half mile walk from Jerusalem to to Emmaus. So if we were to take that walk today, it would be somewhere between two and two and a half hours. For two or two and a half hours, Luke tells us in chapter 24, he tells us that Jesus taught them about himself from the Old Testament. Here's the question I ask my students when I teach a class on hermeneutics, which is how to 
interpret the Bible, how to study the Bible, asking this question. Is there anybody in here <clears throat> that for the next two or two and a half hours would like to teach us out of the Old Testament about Jesus? And there's usually nobody that says a word. And I say, well, if you can't do that, then you're not reading the Bible the way Jesus did. Because that's how he read. In fact, in John 5, he says that Scripture testifies about him. He's got some scribes and Pharisees that are reading Scripture, and, and they think that the, the, the Scripture, they're finding eternal life. He says, you won't come to me. He says, but those Scriptures, they testify about me. In other words, the Old Testament is about Jesus. And let's be, let's be honest, most of us don't know the Old Testament very well. Would you say amen to that? Amen. <clears throat> 85 sermons, 85% 85 of the sermons in America are in the New Testament. So 15% are out of the Old Testament. How many, you don't have to raise your hand, just to, you, you're going to laugh, you're going to agree. How many started that Bible in a year plan and you were cranking along till you got to Leviticus? <laughs> Leviticus has killed more Bible in a year studies than any book ever. It, 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 Le Leviticus usually is a straight path to Matthew. Can I get an amen? You know, it's just it's like, okay, we're, I don't know what the pots and pans are and all this other stuff. We're going to go to here. So, so, so let me show you how Scripture is about Jesus, even back then, so in John 19, Jesus is on the cross, and John is the only gospel writer that records this. Matthew, Mark, and Luke do not. John is very, very aware of Genesis. Genesis 1 starts in the beginning, right? John 1, 1 starts in the beginning. If you read John through the beginning of chapter 2, he will catalog for you Seven days. They're not chronological days. He just says in this day, this day, and then on the third day, if you add them up, it's seven days. Why is that important? Because there were seven days of creation. He's, he understands Genesis very well. God breathed on Adam and he came, became a living soul. Jesus will breathe on the disciples in, in, in John. He's very aware of Genesis. So in John 19, when Jesus is on the cross and he hangs his head in the sleep of death, we're told that a centurion comes and pierces his side. Jesus in his sinlessness, his side is pierced. What comes out of his side is blood and water. Blood and water is the substance that creates the church, his bride. And when he awakens on the third day, he awakens in the garden. Because Mary Magdalene says, I thought you were the gardener. When he awakens on the third day, he awakens to a woman that is a type of, of his bride. She's not perfect. She's been possessed by seven demons in her life. She's an example of what Jesus' church will look like. Those of us that have had all kinds of issues, all kinds of problems, but that he loves. And so you can see that the, the scriptures are about Jesus. Let me show you how much cooler, though, we can even go on how even words matter in scripture. I call this verbs <clears throat> because in Genesis 3, we have the fall of humanity. And here's what the text says. It says, she, this is Eve, she took of its fruit and ate. And she also gave some to her husband who was with her. And he ate. You always have to ask the question, why wasn't he standing up? He was there with her. Why didn't he say something? Let me tell you something. The church needs men to stand up and be who they've been called to be. So he's with her. He ate. These are verbs. Took, gave, and ate. These are the verbs of our fall. Then the eyes of both were open, and they realized their nakedness. They realized their guilt. They realized their shame. Well, Luke, <clears throat> when Jesus is walking with the disciples to Emmaus, it says that he would have gone further, but they asked him to come in to the house, and he does. And we're told that he took the bread, he gave it to them, they ate, and their eyes were opened, and they saw him. What Luke has done is he's realized that because of Jesus, the verbs of our fall have now become the verbs of our restoration. See, not... And every single word matters in Scripture. Let's look at another one here. I call this the corresponding beginning and ending. When you read books in antiquity, especially in the first century and a little before, that they had common ways in which they sort of would write. They would start off, it's an oral tradition, which is A-U-R-A-L. Aural is hearing. You didn't have iPads and books and all of these things. You had to remember the stories. And so what they would do is they would start, they would go up an inverted V 
And then they would come back down the mountain. We'll talk about that this, this evening. You want to be here for this because this is, these books are all that way. I mean, it, it, even the center of all these books, they matter. Like, what's the center of the Gospel of John? The ruler of the world has been cast out. What's the, what's the center of the book of Revelation? The dragon is cast out of heaven. What's the center of 1 John chapter 3? Jesus came to destroy the works of the devil. You think those are just there in the middle because of some reason, because of just some happenstance or circumstance? No. Every one of these books is written in a way that is just profound. And it's, it's so incredible the way the writers write. And so what they'll do is they'll start at the beginning of a book and they'll tell you the same thing at the ending of a book. It'll be different people, but same names. Or it'll be different situations, but same sort of circumstances so that you can remember. You know, Augustine, when he wrote Confessions, he starts off, he says, my heart is restless. At the end of Confessions, he says, I found rest in you. Plato's Republic, he starts off with the myth of Gyges. He ends with the myth of Gyges. That's where Tolkien got the Lord of the Rings from. Everybody knew their geography. So Luke, when he writes, at the beginning of his gospel, he tells us about Mary and Joseph. And everybody knows who Mary and Joseph are. We know that Mary has been told she's going to have a child. She, she's, a, she's a virgin. She, she births Jesus. She's told this is the name. You're going to give the, the son Jesus. And then she, we, we hear that he is wrapped in linen cloth, and he's placed in a manger. Now, most of us, when we read that, we have our ideas of what we read because most of us have nativity scenes at home that we sort of know and go, oh, there's the wood and the hay and all of this stuff. It's interesting because when I go to Israel, I usually get six, seven times. Um, <clears throat> we go every year, and uh, we missed the last couple because of COVID and those things, but we'll go again in February. But when we, we go, when we get to Tel Megiddo, um, there's mangers that are there. And it's interesting when we gather around and we go, this is a manger. Everybody goes, what? That's a manger? Let me show you what a first century manger looks like. This is a manger. That's probably not what your nativity scene at home has as a manger, I would suspect. It's made out of limestone. It's a feeding trough. And, and what animals would do is feed here. I want you to imagine what it would look like for a baby to be wrapped in linen cloth looking like a mummy, sitting inside of this that looks a lot like a sarcophagus. Because the shepherds were told they would have a sign. And the sign would be that they found a baby in swaddling cloths lying in a manger. What they're going to see is they're going to see a baby that looks dead, but's alive. That's pregnant with meaning. The baby's also going to be in a feeding trough. Animals feed here. You and me will also feed when we come to the Lord's table, when we participate with the bread and the wine. These are not, God is sovereign. He ordains things in ways that are beyond us. Now what's awesome is how this corresponds to the ending of Luke. Because when you get to the ending of Luke, in chapter 23, <clears throat> we find another Mary and Joseph. Not the same Mary and Joseph, but the names are important because they help you bookend. Mary Magdalene, Joseph of Arimathea. What do they do? They take the body of Jesus down off of the cross and they wrap it in linen cloth. He is placed in a rock-hewn tomb in which no man has ever laid. That's virginal. He is in a rock-hewn hewn virginal tomb and he comes forth on the third day from that. The bookends are beautiful. The linen cloths, the Mary and Joseph, the rock hewn tomb, the manger, all of that stuff is there to let you see the magnificence of what God is doing in the person of Christ. And it also makes the Bible awesome. Let's look at John 4. I call this a wife at the well. <clears throat> you probably know the story. It's a woman at the well. Why do I call it a wife at the well? I do that because John knows Genesis. John knows Genesis incredibly well. And so in Genesis, what do we know? Well, we know that Moses with Zipporah. We know that Isaac and we know that Jacob, these patriarchs, where did they find their wives? They found them at a well. So it's not just a throwaway thing. So in John 3, when John the Baptist says the bridegroom comes, what's a bridegroom come for? Comes for his bride. John, John's theology is, one of his themes is bridal theology. And you see it through his gospel. You see it culminated in the book of Revelation with the bride of Christ, the church. So 
when Jesus is called the bridegroom, that's the, the Lord was calling in right now. Say, so listen to that guy that's up there talking. He's, he's telling you something good. So, so, so listen, when, when, when we hear the bridegroom is coming for the bride, what should we expect? Well, it shouldn't surprise us that Jesus ends up in John 4 at a well. So here he is at the well. What's going to happen? What well is it? It's Jacob's well. Well, what do we know about Jacob's well? Well, it's, it's the largest narrative in the Old Testament. What happened at Jacob's well? Well, Jacob was there in the middle of the day. Nobody comes to the well in the middle of the day except Rachel shows up in the middle of the day. She's so beautiful that he just, he, he doesn't know what to do. So you know what he does? He runs over and the stone that's on top of the well that usually takes three, four, five men to pick up and take off, he goes by himself, lifts it up, and puts it down as if to say, look at me, I am a strong man. He's stricken by her beauty. Well, he's so stricken by her beauty, he wants to marry her. Well, Laban, who's a deceiver like he is, after seven years of working for him, rather than giving him Rachel, he gets Leah. And we're told in the text that he doesn't love Leah because she's not pretty. He loves the beautiful woman. Well, here we are at Jacob's well. You should know the story. You should know what's going on. It's the middle of the day. And who comes? Who's going to show up? Is it going to be the strikingly beautiful girl? No, it's actually a Samaritan. Part Jew, part Gentile with a past and she shows up and Jesus says you've been married five times and you're living with someone right now she came to the well in the middle of the day because she didn't want to have to deal with who she was she didn't want to gather with the community and them talking about her and her past and everything else she's come by herself and she's met Jesus and she asks a really important question. She says, are you greater than our father, Jacob? Can you love the unlovable? Can you love the one that's broken? Can you love the one with scars? And of course, she finds in Jesus living water and she drops her water pot and she runs back into town. Listen to the words. She says, come meet the man that told me everything I've ever done. She showed up so that she didn't have to deal with all of the things that she's done. But she runs into town after meeting Jesus and says, come meet the man that showed me everything I've ever done. What's happened is in meeting Jesus, her scars have become her testimony. See, this is beautiful because is he greater? Yes. And is she a perfect representation of Jesus' bride? Of course she is because she's both Jew and Gentile. Not throwaway stuff, not just stuff. That's, it's, the Bible is really awesome. It's incredible to read. Let's take another story here. I'm going to tell you a story. Many of you will probably have had paper or you're aware of paper that when you put up to the light, it has a watermark. And you can see it's like usually it's expensive paper that has the watermark. Okay, many of the biblical stories have watermarks to them. In other words, there's sort of an assumption that you know another story that they're using. It doesn't make them lack history. It's historically what's happened. But what they've done is they've done it in a way where it harkens back to another story that makes you think about what you're reading in a way that maybe you wouldn't have read it. So let me tell you a story and see if you know what the story is. There is a guy that decides he wants to run from God because he doesn't want to go do what God wants him to do. So he gets on a boat in Joppa. And when he gets on the boat, <clears throat> the boat goes out a little ways and all of a sudden a big storm comes up. And everybody's freaking out on the boat. They're throwing stuff off. They're trying to figure out. They're like, oh, wasn't there some dude that was running from his God that got on our boat? Yeah, where's he at? Let's go find him. Well, they find him and where's he at? He's asleep. So they wake him up and they bring him up on the boat and ask him what's going on. And he tells them, well, you know what? The only way the storm's going to be done because God's going to have to throw me over the boat. They say, that's a great idea. They throw him over the boat. Well, when he's thrown over the boat, you know what happens, right? The sea goes completely calm and the people on the boat say whatever his God was that he was running from must be God and they become worshipers 
of Yahweh. That story is the story of Jonah. So you shouldn't be surprised that the way Mark tells the story is that Jesus and the disciples get in the boat. And when they get in the boat, a storm comes up. And the storm is so bad that the boat's about to break in pieces. And where's Jesus? He's asleep. This sounds familiar. They go grab Jesus and they say, what are we going to do? Jesus doesn't say, throw me over the boat and everything's going to be great. No, Jesus says, peace. And all of a sudden, all the waters stop. Everything goes to glass. And Mark has the disciples asking a question that he's asking you to answer as you read. Who's this that even the wind and the sea obey him? Well, the answer, because of the watermark, is that the God of the Old Testament that calmed the seas for Jonah, that God is in the boat with the disciples, and he is calming the seas in the boat, that Jesus is God in the flesh. Who then is this? He's God. These stories are rich. Let's look at another one. Mary loses Jesus. You ever read this story and be like, how in the world could a mom lose their son? Like, seriously? And if you're going to like lose a son, the, the son of God, you're going to lose him? Come on. You know, you think you pay more attention, right? We're told in the text, the boy Jesus stayed behind in Jerusalem and his parents didn't know it. You read that probably and you go, how did they not know? How would you not know? I mean, we're like helicopter parents, right? You know, around everything. How, well, you have to understand their culture. Their culture, they traveled in caravans. This idea that, you know, people would travel, you know, like our, you know, Jesus and, you know, uh, uh, Joseph and Mary traveled on this donkey to Jerusalem by themselves. That would have never happened, ever, in the first century. They would traveled with people. These are just things. That's why you got to read your Bible. And it says in Luke 2, you go read it. Go home and read it. It says, while they were there in Bethlehem, she gave birth. They were there. They, they weren't running in last second. None of that stuff. They were there. They, nobody would have gone last minute. They went there. There was a place where um, Joseph would have been known. He was of the lineage of David. They were in a house. They weren't in some rented place or some inn, like the King James makes it like it was a hotel or something. Um, Ketulam is the Greek word. It's a house. They were in a house. And, and people would have been there. And, and, the, and the Magi didn't come until he was probably a year and a half or two years old. That's in Matthew. So if you've got the shepherds and the Magi in your nativity scene, that's not correct. Uh, they call me the Christmas killer at Grace when, when I do this story. But you need to go home and read because if you don't read the Bible for yourself, somebody will come and tell you what it says and it might be wrong. That's why it's important to know these stories. So why in the world did she not know it? Okay, well they traveled to Jerusalem for the feast, but they would travel in caravans and oftentimes they traveled with men, with men and women, with women in the caravans. So the men would have thought the women had the kid, the women would have thought the men had the kid. No big deal because everybody sort of looked after everybody's kids. Well, they went a day away from Jerusalem and they realize there's no Jesus. They're like, well, what do we do? Well, it's day two. They realize he's not there. Well, they turn around and they go back. Can you imagine what Mary's heart was doing? Can you imagine if you lost your son? Can you imagine you're thinking, is he okay? What's happened? Is he alive? Can you imagine the emotions that were going on in her life? Luke tells us that when they got to Jerusalem... It was the third day. That's not a throwaway word. That's not just appearing there for no reason. It's important that it's the third day. Why is it important? Because see what God is doing, and it shows you how incredible he is. It shows his love towards you and me. And oftentimes we fail to see it because we're just bogged down with life. What God has done is he's prepared Mary's heart in losing her son, and finding him on the third day. He's prepared her heart for the day when she will lose her son on the cross and she will find him again on the third day. See, these stories are deep and they're powerful and they're profound. The Bible is not just a book that you read to study so you can shoot bullets at people and tell them how wrong they are. The Bible is to read us and to tell us about who Jesus is and about what it means to be a follower of God, what it means to take his name. 
You know, in the Old Testament, one of the Ten Commandments, when it says, take not the Lord's name in vain, that's, that's not a cuss word, by the way. English wasn't even around back then. That means don't ascribe Yahweh's name to yourself and then not live up to what that means. That's what it means to take the name of the Lord in vain. And what we've got to do is realize that we may know Scripture, but we would never let it read us. And we may know Scripture, and we may not actually be doing Scripture. I'm convinced that most American Christians are scripturally overweight. They know a lot more Scripture than they actually do. It's not about knowing it. Jesus doesn't say, blessed are you if you know. He says, blessed are they that do my words. And so when we read Scripture, it reads us, and it tells us about how awesome God is. And so let me, let me finish here with the last story. You probably are very aware of David and Goliath. Most people, even if you didn't grow up in church, you know the story <clears throat> of the little boy that slays the giant. Incredible story, awesome story, all of these great things. So I remember having read the story multiple times. I grew up in church. Um, I grew up in a nominal church. I, I, I grew up in sort of a mainline, you know, traditional church. And I think they taught you about Jesus. I'm not sure anybody ever really knew Jesus. There surely wasn't like relationship. It was more religion than relationship. But I remember as I started studying scripture and was really applying myself and reading the story, w- one day I had this moment where I was like, man, I, how many times have I read this thing and I missed it? Like, goodness gracious. People ask me all the time. They're like, so do you still? I'm like, every single day I open scripture. I always see something. I always find a word. I always see, oh my goodness, how did I miss that? Happens all the time. Because it's just, it's, it's a beautiful thing. I remember when I read this passage, I was like, what is going on here? David took the Philistine's head and brought it to Jerusalem. I've actually taught this before and people are like, that's not in the Bible. And I'm like, no, it actually is. It's 1 Samuel 17, 5. Verse 4 is the first part of verse 4. Like, really? That's in the Bible? Like, why in the world would he sever Goliath's head and then take that big old head on a horse like 15 miles to Jerusalem? That makes no, that's exactly what I wanted to know, right? Why would he do such a thing? That sounds crazy. You know, normally the, my kids say that I have bad dad jokes. It wasn't because he wanted to get ahead in life. Anyway, um, so, <clears throat> but, but, but he takes the head to Jerusalem. Well, at the time, Jerusalem is a Jebusite fortress. So he can't go inside. But he takes the head to Jerusalem. So he would have taken it outside. And every scholar agrees he did one of two things. He either buried the head in the ground or he put it on a stick so that the birds would eat it. Either way, he was taunting the Jebusites. He was basically saying, this giant that I defeated, one day I'm going to come take this city. Which he did. He did come and take the city. Why do you... What's... That's... I mean... Okay, he took the head, put it there, and left. Okay, cool. <laughs> so the head's there, which obviously if it was planted, it would become a skull. If the birds ate it, it would become a skull. It's on this stick. Well, then it dawned on me one day. Oh, yeah. When Jesus was crucified, he wasn't crucified within the city walls. He was actually crucified on the outside of the city walls. And he was taken to a place called Golgotha. You might actually hear the Goliath of Gath in that. The place called the skull. David has placed that head exactly where Jesus will be crucified because Jesus, when he's crucified, will defeat every enemy that anybody will ever face. It's incredible. He's defeated sin. He's defeated death. He's defeated your past. The verbs of our fall have become the verbs of our restoration in Christ. Christ is God in the flesh. He's the one that prepares our hearts in ways we can't even know. And he's the one that has defeated every enemy we will ever face. And the most important one is he's conquered sin, which means you and me can have eternal life with him by trusting that on that cross, he died for my sin. And on the third day, he rose again so that I know that eternity is mine. I want to encourage you. Nothing happens outside of what God 
once. He doesn't ever say, oops. You're not here by accident. You didn't show up just because. You're not here just randomly. You're here because God knew before the foundation of the world that you would be here and he wanted you to hear these truths. He loves you. He died for you. In fact, it says when he saw the cross, he endured the cross for the joy that was set before him. Do you know what that joy was? It was you. You were the joy that was set before him. He died for you. He rose again for you. He wants to have a relationship with you. He wants you to know him. He wants to know you intimately. And so I just want to ask you, maybe you've been a Christian for a long time, but maybe, but maybe you're really, you know, you just sort of, you go through the motions. Maybe this is the time to lean in a little bit more. Maybe you feel far from God right now. Maybe this is God screaming through somebody's voice that he wants to know you more. Or maybe you've never made that decision. Maybe you've come to church. Maybe you're still trying to figure out what's going on. You're trying to connect the dots. But today, for whatever reason, you're like, you know what? Maybe this is the day that I can settle that question of eternity. I just want to give you a chance. I want to pray for you. Um, I want to pray for the church. Um, And and I I want to really ask you to be back out here at at 6 o'clock because I think it'll be something that will be beneficial to you. Would you bow your heads and hearts and let's pray. Father, I humbly ask for your glory and for your glory alone. No one else's glory. Lord, I pray that you would hover over this congregation right now. That you would hover over them, Lord, and do what you do, which is to bring light for your word to be spoken and for you to take chaos and make something good out of it. Lord, I pray for those that feel far from you, that, Lord, they would reach out right now. Give them the faith to reach out to you and say, Lord, please draw me closer. Lord, for those that maybe have strayed some or are are not really in the faith right now, they're sort of leaning out rather than leaning in, I pray that this would be a moment for them that they would lean in. And Lord, if there's anybody here that does not know where they would spend eternity, I pray, Lord, that they would right now make that decision to believe that you died on the cross for their sins and you rose again on the third day. Father, I pray in Jesus' name, that you would minister to your people. You would strengthen them. You would encourage them. Lord, you would lift them up and give them hope, Lord. Let them know that they can trust you, that you are a firm foundation. And no matter if the winds come or the rains come, Lord, if we put our house on you, Lord, we will be okay. I pray that that would be a reality. I pray for this church. I pray, Lord, that you would continue to make it a light in the community of Lakeland. And I pray, Lord, that you would raise up an army of people here that really want to know your word, really want to study your word, Lord, and and become the people that you've called us to be. We thank you, we praise you, and we love you. In Jesus' name, and all of God's people said, Amen. 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 Can we thank Dr. Chip Bennett, everybody?